We are continuing in the series of Bible studies in the role of women. So we began looking at the diagnosis of the problem. And then we looked at how the Old Testament or what the Old Testament teaches us about women. We looked at the creation accounts and so how at the point of creation God established the roles. And then we looked at the changing manner of those roles on account of the fall of man at the point of sinning. And we looked especially at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. And we saw the punishment uh, that was given to the man, to the woman, to Satan. And as we were coming to the end of last Sunday's worship, uh, Bible study, I introduced a bit of the New Testament and how the New Testament um, regards women. Particularly, if you remember, we looked at the Lord Jesus Christ and his regard for women during his ministry here on earth. And we looked at several scriptures, if you recall. And tentatively, what we said is that Christ never took the position that women by their very nature could not understand spiritual truths. That is not the position he took. He not only included them in his audiences whenever he taught the word of God, but he used illustrations and images of women that would be familiar to the environment where he was. We saw that in Matthew 13 and 33, 22, 1. We saw that he would use even parables in which the um, starring figures would be women. Um, and remember, eventually in John 4, we see that it is to the Samaritan woman at the well that Christ revealed himself as the Messiah. We discussed with that topics such as eternal life, true worship of God, how God is supposed to be worshipped in truth and in spirit, the nature of true worship. He discussed that with a lady. You remember Mary and Martha, the sisters, to Lazarus? Do you remember them? To them, Christ discussed the things of the kingdom of God. You remember he was teaching Mary and ended up admonishing Martha for looking much more to uh, food that goes into the stomach and less to spiritual food. Pointed out to her the priority of learning spiritual truth. And even that over other womanly responsibilities like serving guests in one's home and things like that. So Christ, we see, has an attitude about women which welcomes them into the things of God, welcomes them into spiritual growth as everyone else should enjoy. But friends, in the days when Christ lived, women were not regarded that highly by the culture of the Jews at that time. Not even the Romans regarded their women highly. Ordinarily, they were not allowed to have physical contact even with strangers. Muslims have proceeded even after that time to propagate that idea that women must be covered up even. They, they must not be ordinarily um, seen to, to, to dress up openly like men. You know, they must have to cover up themselves. And those are because of cultural bias 
against women. Look, for example, at Luke 13 and verse 10, so that you appreciate what I'm trying to, to say about these times and as we contrast it with how Christ looks at women. Luke 13 and verse 10. Please stand there with me. Luke 13 and verse 10 and following. Someone find it, can read it? This being an interactive study, anyone can read. Read 13 and verse 10. Luke chapter 13 and verse 10. Now he has he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And behold, there was a woman who had had a dis disabling spirit of 18 years, for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully stra straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And his, he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Okay, so you can leave it there. And put your, put your finger there as we look at Mark 5, 25. Backwards to Mark and chapter 5, verse 25. Just notice that as he healed her, he laid his hands on her. He touched her with his hand. Let's go to Mark 5 and 25. And following... Someone else can read. You can start for half from uh, half of 24 and a great crowd. Eh? Okay. Mark, Mark chapter 5 from verse uh, 24b. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? Mm. Just go on. And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Thank you. So then you can see there uh, a woman who has a discharge of blood. We know from Deuteronomy, even if we do not go to the text, that that would be an unclean person. All right, in terms of the Jewish culture, an unclean person. Worse still, she is a woman. And he touches the Lord, and the Lord does not rebuke her for this. Instead, he lovingly heals her. You can see that Christ's view of women is that they deserve his goodness, they, they are entitled to his goodness 
like everyone else. He therefore allows this woman to have physical contact. In the story that we looked at in the book of Luke and chapter 10, where he healed a woman who was bent over by touching her, a look at the commentaries say that the indignant, the, the indignant ruler of the synagogue was not just indignant because of the healing on the Sabbath, but the fact that Christ in an open space in the synagogue would lay his hands on a strange woman. After the resurrection, in John chapter 20, verse 1, Christ appeared to Mary Magdalene. Do you remember Mary Magdalene? Who is Mary Magdalene? Who remembers who Mary Magdalene was? Yes. There you are. But she had become a follower of Christ. She had over time become a follower of Christ. And by the time Christ is done dying, she is a follower of Christ. She's a disciple of Christ. And this woman is the first to whom Christ appears and tells her that go and tell other disciples, announce the good news that I have risen from the dead, that you have seen me. Yet, in those days, women were not allowed to be witnesses because Jewish culture considered women to be liars. There are some very strange ideas. They were considered liars and therefore their testimony would not be believed. But Christ tells Mary Magdalene to go and announce his resurrection to the disciples. We find that in John and chapter 1, uh, chapter 20, verse 1 to 18. So, in all we see that Christ's view, Christ's view of women is that of equality. In matters of faith. Okay? Matters of faith. They are equal to men, and men are equal to them. But let us also now today look at the epistles, the writings, the, 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 the letters and the epistles as they concern women and their state before God. Let us turn to Galatians and chapter 3 and let us look at verse 28. Galatians, if you do not mind, turn to Galatians and chapter 3 and let us look at verse 28. Unless someone has a question about Christ and women, I would rather now we tackle for today Galatians chapter 3 and verse. And I think for purposes of context, if we can start reading from 25. Anyone can read from 25? She is you can read, 25. <coughs> Galatians 3.25. But then you'll read through to 20, um, to 28, okay. even to 29. Okay. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Okay, so there we have Paul writing to the Galatians and telling them about God's view or the godly view 
of all of us before God when it comes to matters of salvation. When he talks about, and I'm, I want you to answer this, when he talks about, in verse 28, Jew nor Greek, what is the disparity that he's talking about? Pardon? Racial issues. Okay? When he talks about Jews and Greeks, he's tackling race. The question of race. Or if you like, tribe. Isn't it? That when it comes to salvation, no race is superior to the other. When it comes to God's view of our need for salvation because of our sin. No race stands a better chance. No race is preferred to the other. In that same verse 28, there is yet another thing he talks about. Do you see it? Slave or free. Slaves and their masters. All of them are in need of salvation. All of them are in need of salvation. None is more needy when it comes to salvation than the other. Then he comes to the issue of gender. Male and, and female. And he says they too are equal. And the final sentence he uses in that verse is that we are all one in Christ. We are all one in Christ. And if we are in Christ, then we are Abraham's offspring and all equally hears according to the promise that was given to Abraham. The epistles show us that there is equality between men and women. Equality between men and women. Indicating that the way of salvation is the same for both men and women, and that we, once we become saved, have equal standing in the body of Christ. We have equal standing in the body of Christ. But friends, this itself does not, however, eradicate all the other differences in terms of responsibilities and roles that men and women have. And those who have wanted to, to gloss over those differences in roles have used this scripture. Galatians. Galatians 3.28. That is a scripture that they normally use. But this passage does not cover all and every aspect of God's design for males and females. This scripture, this passage, talks only about the equality in terms of standing be before God in matters of salvation. In matters of salvation. Because in addition to those, there are many other passages that make a clear distinction between what God has designed for men or what he desires for men to do and what he desires for women, especially within the family and within the church. And so when you use this scripture out of context, it will appear that you can have women pastoring churches because we are the same in terms of roles. They can be elders or elders, if there is a word like that. Or they can be deaconesses, 
if you like, or they can be pastores, if you like, or anything that you want to call them. But the truth is that this scripture goes only to explain our standing in terms of salvation before God. And that is important for us to understand. It is only so far as salvation is concerned. It is in so far as our inherent natures as human beings are concerned that we are equal. That we had seen in Genesis. That we had seen in Genesis. And then when we come to the need for salvation, we see in Galatians chapter 3 that we are equally in need of salvation. Men and women, boys and girls, we are equal slaves and those who are free, those of every race, are affected by sin and therefore in need of salvation. And when we get saved, no matter what race we come from, no matter what gender we are, whether we are slaves or free, we have an equal standing before God. We have an equal standing before God. Now, like we had seen before, there are other passages that clearly indicate that we have different roles. Marriage, if we can narrow down to the family. So we have seen uh, uh, Christ and a bit of the epistles in terms of salvation. But let us now narrow down to the family. Let us narrow down to the family. And as always, we look to the word of God for guidance. Ephesians 5 and chapter 21. Ephesians 5 and 21. We start finding, we want to look at these four passages. We will look at Ephesians 5, 21 and following. We will look at Colossians 3. Can we, maybe I, I need to share this out so that we, we move a little fast. Who can do for us Ephesians 5, 21 and following? Who, who shall do that for us? Okay. Jude, you will do that for us. And then Darius. Do for us Colossians 3.18. Colossians 3.18. Who can do for us Titus chapter 2? Deacon Boni, chapter, chapter 2 of Titus, verse 5. And who will do for us 1 Peter 3? 1 Peter 3, Callistus will do for us 1 Peter 3.1. 1. Okay. Shall we have Ephesians 5.21? Start it from 17. No, start it from 18. That's okay. Yeah, just start it from 17 for context. Because I am looking at 21. Okay. Uh, Ephesians 5, 17 says, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then, okay, so, 22. So, so if, if just stop there, the, uh, um, uh, Jude. In terms of fellow, being a fellow Christian, okay, in terms of being a fellow Christian, we are supposed to submit to one another, isn't it? As Christians, we are supposed to submit to one another. I'm supposed to submit to a fellow Christian, and a fellow Christian is supposed to submit to me. 
in terms of our walk of faith. In terms of our walk of faith. So that even if we were wife and husband, in so far as our Christianity is concerned, we submit to one another. Isn't it? In so far as our walk of faith. But now when it comes to wives and husband, then 22 comes in. Do I read? Yes. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Mm -hmm. Then 25. 25 says, Husbands, love your wives as mm -hmm. Christ loved the church and gave himself up to her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves, loves himself. himself. So we can see that at that point in time, there is now a clear distinction in terms of roles with the husband being given a role of loving his wife to the standard of Christ's love for the church, and wives being given the role of submitting to their husbands in everything. In everything. So there is now a clarity in terms of roles. Those who are there during the couple's dinner benefited from this teaching, isn't it? Those who are there, do you remember this? This, this part of scripture was taught to us. And I would probably want to add nothing except that some people are not there. The roles are there definite. Let's go to, let's go to Colossians 3.18. Colossians 3.18. Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Okay, so, again, there is that repetition in terms of this now, this, this letter is being written to Colosse, and they are also being told the same thing, that wives are supposed to submit to their husbands, and the reason is now given, isn't it? What is the reason you see given there? What is the reason? Pardon? Yes. It is good before God to do that. It is desirable to God that that be done. That is what is, it means that it is fitting. It is apt. It's appropriate that that is how wives are to conduct themselves. And husbands are also to love their wives and not to be harsh with them. Not to treat them with harshness, with cruelty. The converse must be true, isn't it? That that is what is appropriate before, before God. That is what is good before God. Let us throw our eyes to Titus 2 verse 5. Titus 2, verse 5, you just move ahead. Maybe whoever is reading can start from verse 3 for purposes of context. Titus chapter 2, from verse 3. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or, or slaves to... No, much. actually start from verse 2. Older men... Yeah, older men, yeah. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, 
not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what, you, what is good, mm. and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Okay. So, he tells men, older men in the church, older Christian men in the church, to behave in a certain way. What is the way they have been told to behave, the older men? We are looking at the distinction of roles. Sober-minded, self-controlled men, dignified, sound in faith. Now, that is the part that I want to put stress on. The older men must be sound in faith. How are they going to be sound in faith? What, how, what do you think they must do to be sound in faith? Pardon? Studying the word of God. There, there's no way they're going to get any soundness in faith, in the Christian faith, if they are those who do not study the word of God. They, they're not going to be sound in faith. In love and in steadfastness, they must be stable in their faith. They must be stable in their faith. They must have some sense of stability in what they believe in. They can be able to defend that faith. They can be able to defend that faith. They know what they believe in and they can defend it. And they can teach it. It, it is clear to them. And then comes to the older women. What are they supposed to do, the older women? Pardon? They should be Reverent in behavior. Who can explain to us what that means? What is reverence in behavior? Who can help us? Pardon? Good behavior? Uh -huh. Rather general? Uh -huh. Yes, Deacon? The, the, the word reverence brings to mind uh, the knowledge or idea of God mm -hmm. or, or godly fear, so mm -hmm. to speak. Uh, and so then reverent behavior means a, a kind of character that is godly, that is acceptable to God, that is God glorified. That is fearful before God, that reveres God. Okay? That is fearful before God. Reverence in their behavior. What else? Not... Not slanderers. Remember the attitude of the Jews towards women? They were thought of as liars generally. It was, it was a very bad blanket thing that was thrown on women. But maybe there was a problem with the ladies when it comes to a bit of gossip here and there. And, and so they were being told, don't be slanderers. Avoid that path. Okay? Avoid that path. And don't drink too much. Don't be slaves to wine. Don't be people who get drunk on wine. What else are the women supposed to do? They are to teach what is good. Isn't it? They are to teach what is good. And who are they supposed to be teaching? the younger women amongst them, and, and to love their aunt and children. Okay? So even they are supposed to love. Only that the standard of love I see given to men is quite high. But they are too supposed to love their, women, their husbands and children. What else are they supposed to be doing? Self-controlled, Pure, that means they should not um, adulterate, all right? That is purity. Working at where? Working at home. They should be homemakers. They should work at home. And while they are working at home, they should be, they should be kind and submissive to who? their husband. 
This thing is so clear. You can see the giving of roles. Biblically, giving of roles. Women. Christian women. Wives who are Christian are to be homemakers. Submissive to their husband. Taking care of their children. Loving their children and their husbands. And especially the older ones in the church are supposed to teach the younger ones. They are supposed to teach the younger ones how to love their husbands and how to undertake these roles that they have been given. And the Bible says that if the women do this and if the men do what they have been told to do, the word of God will not be reviled. Who would revile the word of God? Who would revile the word of God? Who? Non-believers, the heathen. If we who are Christians don't behave the way God has told us to behave, both men and women, the name of Christ would be ridiculed. The name of Christ would be ridiculed. The word of God would be reviled. The heathen will say, even they don't do these things. The so-called Christians behave in this way. I remember uh, we were talking here in office uh, with Pastor, and he was telling us about something about uh, someone who now had a negative attitude uh, to the word of God because of, ah, we were talking about the Holy Spirit. You remember? The CU thing, where this person had gone and behaved in a certain way. And someone else was saying, if, if, if that is how Christians, be, it was at your house. It was actually at his house during the home group meeting. If, if those who are there in the church side home group, uh, in the town side home group meeting will remember. And, and so the word of God was being reviled. Christ's name was being ridiculed because of the behavior of a, a so-called Christian. If we don't behave the way we are advised in terms of our roles. There will be no order, and the name of Christ would be revived. So it's as if the writer uh, Titus is, is the writer Paul, as he writes to Titus, seems to be telling him that there is a consequence to not behaving this way, isn't it? There is a consequence to not be not not the older men not behaving the way I, I have described, and the older women not behaving. In this. There's a consequence, and the consequence is that the name of God would be revived. So wives and mothers are urged to be workers at home. Workers at home. If you like homemakers, home managers, uh, someone who manages the household, um, uh, uh, of course, with leadership from the husband. Of course, with leadership from the husband. And so when it comes to, 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 to our Christian walk, one with a, we submit to one another. I remember giving the example of, of a wife uh, cautioning a husband. And saying, please don't, don't go there. Don't go there now. If you are a Christian husband, you don't take offense because you've been cautioned by your wife, isn't it? If, it? if that caution is to help you not to sin, you don't take offense. You submit to that caution. If it is the wife and your husband cautions you because you are almost falling into sin and they can be able to see it, maybe your eyes are clouded at that point of time and you can't see it, then you submit to that advice as a wife, and you avoid falling into sin. You become each other's keepers in, in regard to that. You become those who are sub submissive to one another, submitting to one another because of your faith. But your roles are different. And those roles are God-given in the word of God. So that for the ladies, their home and their children are supposed to be their priority. In contrast to the world's emphasis 
today on careers and full time jobs for women outside of the home in the name of equality and and men who are willing to to take the back seat and not be providers for their households not be providers for their households in the false name of equality that is not biblical the bible teaches us different it teaches us roles and says women this is your role men this is your role of course even as a man you still are supposed to lead your household isn't it in all things you lead your household in a godly way giving advice even on how the house is to be managed in a godly way getting your wisdom from the word of god as you give those advices any questions or comments to that part because now i want to go to the church any questions sorry any questions or 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 comments up to that point there's a question there then a comment here this one is a comment yes this one is a comment okay my comment in emphasizing the critical importance of the roles as designated in the bible the roles of the men and women is important because as the world has continued to develop and interact there is a sense of laissez faire there is a sense of equality and competition to a point that if there were no structures in place that people would fall back on i imagine that there is going to be a state of chaos in homes and in families without any point of reference to be able to give guidance when there is such disorder so thank you pastor wanted to give a comment on this yeah, just uh, making uh, some little emphasis in chapter 2 of titus that you've read and verse number 3 uh, 4 chapter 2 chapter 2 of titus i'm just with on the same passage yes you've just been looking at titus chapter 2 verses 3 and 4 um just so that i make a few comments um it says all the women uh, that is in the church uh, likewise just like all the men are to be reverent in behavior no slanderers or slaves to much wine and then i want to make a comment on what follows they are to teach what is good and we i think probably overlapping between point number 4 and 5 mm. on on the board there mm. the question is to teach who isn't it yes so verse 4 has what is being who is being taught mm -hmm. and so train the young women to love the husbands and children and so the teaching here is very specific in the sense that they are teaching young women they are in a local church titus is supposed to put in order if you remember verse 5 uh, the local church where he is supposedly uh, the overseer and he is to instruct the older women in the local church to teach what is good to the younger ones so their audience uh, are the younger ones now not only are they to teach but they are supposed to train verse number 4 teaching and training are a bit different because they are almost the same the training has to do with uh practice giving practical examples um you don't gather a women in a corner and dump knowledge on them you're supposed to pursue them in their own local homes as an older woman you're supposed to if this woman gives birth to a child and you want to train them to love that child you go home to be them you help them to you know take care of that child you actually give a practical demonstration practical illustration of how that loving that child looks what it looks like 
what it actually means in practicality to love our husband. You get the point? Mm. So it is a training by giving examples and showing what actually we mean, not just by dumping knowledge or information. You begin to see that it's a serious ministry. Mm. And that is the ministry of women in a local church. They are to look out for younger ones and to not only teach but to train them. Surely this takes place back at home. Mm. So it's expected that all the women in this local church will be going to homes to train those younger ones on how to love their husbands, love their children, and to be self-controlled to even make that home. What does it mean, for example, to prepare dinner for your husband? You see the point? What does it mean to love by working at home? What does it look like, actually? Because they don't know. The assumption here is that they are. Okay? They, are, they don't know what is to be done. And that probably is the reason there are frictions at home when people begin families. The young ones have never done this. I mean, this is a lady who is 21 years old. She's getting married. She's never been married before. She has no idea completely what it means to love her husband or to offer food or to serve food at the table. So you go as an older woman, you show them, practically speaking, what it means. How do you do this? How do you serve this? How do you deal with the children? the ones even that are stubborn. So this training is a very important aspect of it. And so I wanted to make that stress that it involves both teaching and, and, and training. training. And I think what is neglected in the local church day is number four, training. People are quick to teach, but they are very slow to train. Yes. And so in a local church like this, if you talk about women's ministry, we mean teaching women and training them so that they have their roles at their fingertips. Not <laughs> teaching them theology as it were, okay? <laughs> theology is being taught by the pastors of the church. That is our role. <laughs> we are the ones who teach you the word of God in terms of the theology. But when it comes to the practical matters of life, that's the work of the women in a local church. So that, that's why it's overseers of this church. We begin to reorient and focus women's ministry. What is supposed to accomplish? It is not a duplication of the pulpit where you also go and study theology, okay? You become a small pastor in a local group or some, uh, context. It is a training of younger women so that they know their roles at home. Mm. And you train them so that until they are able to do so. When they grow older, they also teach others. It's, it's being parted, uh, passed down with generations. Thank you very much. And yeah, there's another comment there. Can be. I have a question in yes. regards to um, verse 5 of chapter 2 of Titus that we have just verse 5 chapter 2 of Titus that yes. we have just read that says that women should work at home. Mm -hmm. What then is your view of women who work full time outside the home? And and given that now there are very many women working outside of home uh, what is your view on that? What is your take? Mm. Or what does the Bible say about that? Mm. Okay. So, the, the, any other question before I answer that one? There is over there. She has just asked, what is your view on women who now work full time? And two, there are very many who now do that. All right. And three, what is the Bible's view of that? That, that's your question summarized. Three portions of it, yes? yes? Uh, my question is from what I was asked last week mm -hmm. about uh, the role of women in, in society. Uh, so the question uh, was, if a woman is given a leadership role, for example, in the office, mm -hmm. uh, what should be the response of a Christian woman uh, if given the leadership role in the office. Mm -hmm. In the office. Okay, so I hope we are hearing all those questions. There was someone else whose hand was up. Uh, it was Paul. Okay. Uh, question is, I guess it's the same thing, but I want it to be more clear. My, uh, is it wrong for a woman, a married woman, to work for, for in our context eight to five job and we maybe have kids 
Is it wrong? Is it wrong for a woman to work five to eight to five? Eh? Eight, eight to five job. And the family ask it. Who says we have answered all these questions? Who believes that all these three questions have been answered? You guys, you guys didn't hear me talking. <laughs> I thought we have answered them. I actually thought we had answered them. But it is not bad to go over it again, isn't it? Because I thought we had answered them. Remember that we are, that's why I kept doing this. We are talking about Christian women. All right? Our sister Carol's questions almost borders on the principle that something so bad becomes good if it has been done for a long time. Right? There are many polygamists. Is polygamy a good thing? In, in the eyes of God. But there are many polygamists. There are men with many, many wives. Three, four, five. Akukudanja used to have 40. Right? But uh, does that make it right? That people are doing it? There are so many people who lie. Who, has, who, who just live by lying. Uh, and there are many. Does that make it good? It doesn't. It really does not. Where the Bible, in God's wisdom, friends, where God himself, who designed marriage, God who designed marriage, because we saw that in Genesis, didn't we? Those who went to the couple's dinner also saw it, that the design for marriage was by God. Obviously, he would be the best person, best place, to give the rules to guide it. Right? That it would be the best person. When it comes to divorce, what does Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount talk about divorce? He says, Moses allowed you to divorce just because you guys are hard-headed. But God hates it. God doesn't like it. Isn't that what he says? He says he, he allowed you. Moses told you you could, could give divorce certificates. But it's not because that was the initial plan. The initial plan of God was that a man and a woman should live together until death do them part. Nowadays, people can divorce for, for everything. Those of us who are in the legal professions know that even the Marriage Act has been amended, isn't it? It has recently been amended. Now we are not divorcing according to the old common law tradition. Now you can also divorce. Initially, it used to be what, Jude? Adultery, cruelty, desertion, isn't it? Now they have added a fourth one. If it has become irretrievably broken. And it is you to decide that this marriage, it is irretrievably broken. I cannot accuse my wife of adultery. I can't accuse her of cruelty or desertion. I just no longer like her. And we are not atupendani. We are not compatible. I, I don't think we are compatible anymore. And so you just start behaving in a certain way in your house until you, are, you can't live with your wife. It has just become too difficult. Then you say, it has irretrievably been broken down. You tell her, you go and sleep in that room, I will sleep in this one. For two years, you go and tell the judge, you know, for two years, we have not been sleeping together. This thing is broken down. And the judge will say, okay, it's now a rule in the law. You can separate. The other day, there was an, a bill to amend it so that we can now start doing it by consent. Isn't it? There was already a bill in Parliament to amend it so that we can now start doing uh, divorce by, by, consent, by consensus. But is that, what, is that what God wants? According to what Jesus teaches in, in, in Matthew. That's not what God wanted. So in the same vein, by parity of reasoning, 
the mere fact that there are so many women who are now holding professional jobs and working eight to five and are as much breadwinners as their husbands. And therefore, there is that sense of equality, what you'd call competition, doesn't make it right before God. God in his foolishness, if you like, has designed it that women should work at home. All right? Isn't that what we have read, friends? I am not importing this one from outside. This is here. We have seen Paul telling it to the Ephesians. We have seen Paul writing the same thing to Titus. And he tells them this is... And in fact, he then says, for this thing to really work, the older women who have learned it well should teach the younger ones. And like Pastor correctly said, not just teach them, but also practically train them. Remember, we are talking about who, which women? Christian women. Those who revere God, who live in reverence to God. That is why I insisted on us explaining what reverence is. Fear of God. Fear of God. So if you have a wife who has also children, but she must work be, between five uh, eight to five on a daily basis, not regarding the fact that their children are at home. Ordinarily, then what happens? We, let's be practical about this. Even if now, now I will not go to the church, I will do the church next week. What happens when you have that kind of scenario that Paul is describing? When you have your wife, you have children, but she has to work eight to five. What then happens? You have to get who? A house. Help for those who can afford it. Right. So you get there. A house help. What does the house help generally do? Of the home. She basically comes to do the wife's work. She's there to ensure that there's food on the table. Even me, if I go home and my wife is not there, the maid will be the one giving me food, isn't it? So I come from work and I reach and my wife is not there. Find the maid. Maid, how are you? I'm fine. Is there food? Yes, there is food. Can I have it? We can have it. So the maid, we call them housemates. People call them house helps. Others call them house managers. Whatever you want to call them. But they've taken, they, they practically become the wives. It is rare in Kisumu, I do not know about Nairobi, for people to have houseboys or housemen, if you like. They are, they are called houseboys, but they are men, most of them. It's rare, rare to have them. You normally have the ladies, isn't it? Those are the ones who are in the majority. Now, there are, there are bureaus, isn't it? There are bureaus where they are trained these days, isn't it? You can actually call a bureau and they will be able to give you one who is really trained on how to take care of a house. What has been the result of those things? Some of the results, you know, let us be realistic. Let us be truthful because we are amongst ourselves. So we are in the house together. What has been some of the problems that has resulted in those things? Yes, my sister. Husbands have been taken now by the, the house help, yes? Children have been eloped with by the house help. Children can decide to disappear with the house help. Isn't it? Sometimes you have house helps and your children think that they are the mothers. Your house help has become more motherly to the children than you because you come back home tired. I mean, you're just a human being. If you do the kind of work I do, you get exhausted. You, you go and just your mind just gets exhausted. By the time you come home, you can barely breathe. And the children want mommy, mommy, mommy. You, you start asking the maid, have you, have you, did you not take care of these children properly? How come these children are complaining? Now you even start quarreling with your maid. The problem we then have is that the maid or the house helps, whatever you want to call them, take up the roles of wives. Isn't there a likelihood of disorder? 
More often than not, those housemates are younger than your wife. Okay? Many a men have been known to be tempted to enter into adulterous relationships with them because they are much younger, much more submissive, because you have much more control over them, and your wife is not there. So it becomes a source of temptation. God who designed marriage and knows what we go through as human beings. Christ who in Hebrews we have been told has been tempted in every way as we have. Knows, in fact, sympathizes with our situation. Designs that the wife should manage the house and the husband should love the wife and provide. He's the one who gives the roles. Now we can decide that we are not going to follow those rules, and then we'll be ready to take the consequences. Isn't it? Yes. So my answer to all these questions is the same. Notwithstanding that it has been done over and over and over again, for Christian men and Christian women, let us go back to the Word of God and say, what does the Word of God say? What does the Word of God say? If we have older women in the church, in our church here in GBC, could you kindly take seriously these roles, isn't it, in the women's ministry? And say, oh, we are the older women in the church. Can we follow up on the younger women and teach them how to love their husbands, how to love their children, how to be reverent towards, reverent towards God? Teach them how to be good homemakers. That is a huge ministry for the older women in the church. Isn't it? It's a huge ministry. As opposed to a situation Pastor Keith was telling us here the other day. As opposed to the older women coming, you know, after preaching, they have another ministry out here. They are also teaching theology to other women. Sometimes they are making mistakes because they are not theologically trained. But, you know, they just go ahead of it. You know, they make mistakes as they, as they go along. Meanwhile, the pastor has been studying the word of God for an entire week and he has come and preached it. We have no time to synthesize it. To think about you have a women's ministry, another teaching. But there is exactly what they are supposed to teach. Who they are supposed to teach and what they are supposed to teach. So that if the older woman, a younger woman's house, and they find that she's struggling on how to maybe manage the house, how to love the children, take care of them, and everything, she could teach and train. Oh, don't do that. You could do it like this. You know, you could do it like this. So they, they train the younger women on how to love their husband better. But instead, we all want to be very good in theology, theology and, and just throw words and 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 you know, show that we know everything, but we don't want to train people. Because that training then is important. Anything you want to add first before I want to close now? Then there is a question there. Just give to her. There is a question or comment for the two of them. You can start muscling then deliver them. It's not a question. We have not tackled first Peter three one. Pardon? First Peter three one. First Peter three one. Yeah, yeah we were supposed yes. to tackle. Yeah, we didn't go to it. Yeah, we didn't go to it. But you can do it. You can read it. Thank you, Elder. I think um, we all believe that uh, the Bible is our guide and our manual. I think maybe we could uh, take some time and uh, go through uh, Proverbs 31, uh, 10. Mm -hmm. This woman who fears the Lord, maybe if it could be opened up to us, then it should help us. So first Peter three one you can read it. It's okay. more on it I left it because it is yeah. really just repetitive, but okay. just read it. First Peter three one wives and husbands. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. 
Okay? So, but you know, it starts with the word likewise, isn't it? In a similar manner. So what has he been talking about? Submission to authority. Isn't it? How generally Christians are supposed to be submissive to the authority that governs. That's, that's the context previously in chapter 2. And then he comes there and he says, in the same way, with that kind of submission to authority, wives now, this is the, the submission to the authority of the husband. In the same manner, or likewise, the, husband, the wife should submit to. I left it out just because of time and it was repetitive. But that's, that's what it really means. Thank you, uh, Sister Elizabeth, about that. I think it would be good for us to go to Proverbs. Uh, one of the things that I know we have talked about with Pastor is that another series that is going to come still on, on Christian living is the Proverbs. So if the Lord gives us life and time, then I know that is an area which we will reach. Because uh, it was one of the areas we had listed, Pastor. So I know the Proverbs. God believing proverbs will come. Yeah, but it would help. Yes. Thank you. Just wanted to answer Sister Carol's question more specifically. In verse number five of Titus, chapter two, she was asking what it means when the Bible says working at home. I don't know if that was the question, Carol. Well, she has stepped out. <laughs> All right. Maybe for the benefit of the rest now. Um, when the Bible says working at home, the working here is not uh, uh, as regards what she was asking in terms of income. It is the Bible is not looking at women as idle. All right? In those days, of course, even today, there are women who are just idlers. Um, they are busy bodies. I don't know whether you know that. A eh? they they jump from they jump from one home to another. It is early in the morning. It is eight in the morning. They have it is cold. They have wrapped themselves the leso, going to the neighbor in the neighbor of getting milk for tea, taking two hours there, passing the news they had yesterday to the next woman. And by the time they are coming home, it's eleven a.m. and they left home at seven thirty in the morning. And so Titus tells them, uh, please, older women. Tell these younger ones, because they still have energy to walk around, to be busy at home. Mm. That's what the thing, okay? It is not as regards economic work. We'll look at that in, uh, in, in, in Proverbs 31. As regards economic work, that's a different thing altogether. But it regards, it's as regards the uh, not being idle, not being lazy, all right? You know, you can get a, a woman who's just lazy at home. She wakes up in the morning. She paints her nails, isn't it? She drinks her good juice. She was a frost, a from movie, isn't it? She busy. You bought her screen, so the she Nigerian does. Nigerian movies that have Afro, got, Afro cinema uh, continues shortly. That have got devils and <laughs> yes, and she's scared, but she still watches or soap opera. So the Bible does not uh, uh, permit that kind of Christian woman to just be idle at home, even where, of course, you, like I've said, there will be much to say in Proverbs thirty-one, where a house is involved. She's not supposed to be idle, just being a, a this animal, this pigeon, or um, this bird that spreads, you know, herself or prides herself around. What do you call it? Peacock. Peacock. Just peacocking around. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's not what the Bible says here. She's supposed to be busy at home, busy with the husband, busy with the children, ensuring that things are worked out well. I don't know the Carol. That's the point. It's not a, an economic issue here. It is not being. It's not being idle. Women sometimes are not to be idle, just lazing around, watching movies, isn't it? Because once you subscribe to Netflix, you just enjoy a from cinema continuous sort with some good juice, some cocktail juice, isn't it? Just enjoy your day. Yeah, you're not working. Your husband comes, please go sort out yourself in the kitchen, isn't it? Mm. She, of course, there's microwave nowadays, isn't it? So go warm yourself in the, in the microwave, get your food, please sort yourself out. Surely that's not loving a husband, is it? Is it? No. Women, is it? No. Find letting your husband to go to look for food for, for himself in the kitchen. Is that love? No. Huh? You're not answering. Is, are, you, <laughs> are you guilty as charged? These women don't want to answer. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what you're correcting, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, you, 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 that's, that's not loving your husband. Mm. 
pointing the fridge with your leg. Put it somewhere there. Yes. Surely not like that. Mm. Supposed to be working at home, not being lazy. Yeah. yeah. So it is. It is. It is not idleness. But no, when we go to Proverbs thirty-one, you will see the woman engage also in some economic uh, income generating enterprise, and it will be very. It will not be in contrast to what we are teaching. Eh? It, it is just in line with this. Very much in line with this. But that is in Proverbs 31. God willing will reach there. So that the, the woman is not just supposed to be lazy. And men, don't think this fire is just to the women. I always want us as men to remember our role of loving our wives. Yes, my sister. Yes. By people that women who stay at home are doing nothing, are not yes. working. Yes. And the, the, that couldn't be further from the truth. It cannot be further from the truth. Yes, because there is so much work to be done at home. True. Even us women who are out there in the workforce. By the time you wake up in the morning, you're thinking what's being had for breakfast. You're thinking, is, is, uh, do we have tomato? Do we have onions? You're thinking, what's there for lunch? You're thinking, that child who went to school and was unwell. So it, it's still a lot of work. It's not like you are just sitting at home and being lazy. I agree with you. I, I know they are not lazy. <laughs> but there are some who may be. And those ones, the Bible addresses them. says, please don't be slanderous. Don't just hang around. Be busy doing something. It says, work at home. Isn't it? Work at home. It, the work that women do in housekeeping is, is a lot. Even just to decide what is going My wife sometimes just trips me. Says, what do you think we should have today for supper? I am as blind as a, which is the blindest animal? I don't. I, be, I uh, totally don't. I can't think. I look stupid. I don't know. But her, she knows how to just think about it very quick. They are never lazy. Our wives are not lazy. They work. They work and we thank God for them. Especially those who are godly and those who revere God. We thank God for you. But if you are in the other category, transform. This word is supposed to be transforming us into Christ-likeness as we go along. Shall we pray?